Okay, obviously Albany, not the only place with legal and ethical problems. Former Congressman Michael Grimm, he can attest to that. Grimm just received an eight-month sentence for tax evasion. Now, we're going to talk about that and a lot more with Scott Kaminsky. He is the New York State Assemblyman and also a former prosecutor as well. Scott, thank you very much for a few minutes. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So what's the takeaway um, that, that we should um, think about when we see Michael Grimm going away here? I mean, unfortunately, I think it adds to uh, the atmosphere that we all see in government, that people are fed up and think everyone is corrupt. Uh, last year during my campaign, I knocked on about 4,000 doors, and you have no idea how many people said, I don't really want to spend the 10 seconds talking to you. You're all bums. And I had to say, wait, no, I prosecuted <laughs> corrupt politicians. I'm the guy you want to talk to. And half the time it worked. But it really just shows you um, the atmosphere out there. And, and the Grimm case is especially disheartening because you have a Marine, an FBI agent, somebody that you think if, if, if anyone is going to uphold the law, it would be him. And it was you know, far from the truth. So I think it's a real sad commentary on where we are. And it's a sadder commentary that he was elected after all this evidence was out there. Yeah, well, that's so, one of the worst things that people forget the postscript to it. He ran with this hanging over his head, and he still won. To that end, I'm curious from your perspective. As somebody who came from a law enforcement background, were you surprised by, A, the cynicism that the public has, um, and we joke around, not because he's sitting here, he's one of our favorites here, because he was one of the good guys. But there's so many electeds that should know better, um, and yet, between the letter and the spirit, they don't get it. So, two ends. Were you surprised about how much distrust there is in the public? And then secondly, when you got up there to Albany, that it was as bad as you had heard, if not worse? So... You know, I was one of the the bosses of the public corruption unit under Loretta Lynch. Yep. So I know tons of stuff that people don't know, and hopefully, God willing, will never know. <laughs> and so I was not surprised by any of this, and I happen to know a lot of stuff. I actually chose a different route, which is, and I I am the opposite of a cynic. I'm really optimistic about things, and people ask me, you know, what what I drank for, <laughs> to, you know, when I got up in the morning. But look, if I stayed in my job as a federal prosecutor, there's no doubt that every month I would have gotten a new case or assigned a new case of a new target, a new person. There's no shortage of it out there. Um, but that's also disheartening. I wanted to go up to Albany and try to make some systemic changes to turn that around. You know, it, it's my job to make my former colleagues at the U.S. Attorney's Office less busy. And so we've begun that uh, incrementally, but it's begun. And, the, you know, we have to remember there are 40 new members of the Assembly since 2010. And there's a really good spirit of, it's not youth, because people are different ages, but of, of newness, of freshness, of people that don't really want to take it anymore. And that really manifested itself in a conversation um, a number of us were having about pension reform. And a lot of the older guard were saying to themselves, um, this is draconian. Just because the, the media hates us and some prosecutors are angry, they're going to come take our pensions. We worked a long time for this, and we had jobs before this. They're going to take that too, and this is draconian. And I stopped and said, wait, this only applies if you get convicted. Don't get convicted. <laughs> this has to be very simple. So, you know, th there's no doubt there's a new attitude. I, I really uh, believe that um, the leadership is seeing that and is advancing that. They're giving the more, um, less senior members, rather, more authority. I think it's going to help. Uh, we, our good friend Richard Brodsky, who also was an assemblyman um, in his former life, we have this ongoing debate where he sometimes feels he takes the impossible position of de defending the assembly. His contention is the biggest problems are what's actually legal there, more than actually is when folks outright break the law. A and part of the problem of, the, uh, of some of those legal loopholes lead to these contortions. Do you, do you buy that argument, or is it just, no, there's no gray area. This is black and white, and they're clearly breaking the law. Yeah, so he here's the thing. The, the, the biggest obstacle to reform are people who think, and this is a very widely held attitude, bad people will do bad things, so what's the point? We can't stop people from doing bad things, so what are we doing here? And there is no doubt that bad people will do bad things. But I don't believe that when a lot of people who end up corrupt start out in politics, they are bad people or they, they can't wait for the opportunity to get corrupt. There are opportunities that present themselves and they avail themselves of that, whether it's through outside income, whether it's uh, you know a, a lack of pay that causes them to want more money, outright greed, whatever it is, we let people walk into these situations. So what I say is let's cut down on the opportunities to, to have those. That's why I'm in favor of a full-time legislature. Yeah, that's what, the biggest problem. 
you, you have But you got to pay more, though, yeah, right? You know, right, but you have people who have a job, and then they're legislators, and they mix the two. You know, I, I live in Long Beach, New York. I'm on the boardwalk, either exercising with my family. Everyone says, hey, when are you going back to Albany? August, September, I say January. They say, what? I mean, people are dumbfounded that, that we have a legislature that works, you know, th this much of the year. And I think it, we'd make better laws if we were more professional. And we obviously, um, you know, certainly wouldn't have the temptation for outside income. Is it too cynical of me to say what was designed to be a part-time job was with the legislature was set up? Do you, when you guys are in session, you're there four days a week for all intents and purposes, and you're campaigning for a lot of the other time. You're fundraising. Why would I retain you as counsel for one day a week if that's all the time you can sit, unless I'm trying to buy access or influence? That's not too uh, cynical of me, is it? Look, the, a lot of the cases that have come down in recent years, whether it is the Samson case right now in court, whether it is Kruger, where, whether it is Pedro Espada, you name them. They're all what the... Notice what, he looked at you when he said Espada, yeah. They're, they're, <laughs> all, they're all what, what the politician is doing outside in their other job. And it just creates a whole field where you could get in trouble. And there's no reason why we need to have mm -hmm. it in this day and age, and I'm in favor of changing it. Well, let me try and get you in trouble for a second. Um, uh, we hear from different birdies that the... Um, there are more shoes to drop, um, and that uh, the U.S. Attorney, who's already been very busy, will be even busier right now. Um, you're more wired probably than anybody as it relates to uh, the scuttlebutt on this. Will there be more names? We've already got the Senate Majority Leader one time and the Assembly Leader. Could this go all the way to the third man in the room? Look, I, I have no idea. I didn't work in the Southern District for, for U.S. Attorney Barrara. What I can tell you is that they are out looking day and night every day. You know, I know the guys who worked in the FBI public corruption squad. This is all they do. There are prosecutors all they do. So, you know, I think it's in the interest of Albany and the interest of Washington to reform itself because they will do it for you if you don't do it yourself. I'm sure you guys wanted to jump in here. Well, it didn't seem like Albany gave much consideration to really full-throated ethics reform in the last session. There was some that moved earlier in the session, but not a lot as the session came to a close. What more needs to be done, and, and why doesn't there seem to be enough momentum? How many people is it going to take lock, carted off in handcuffs before other lawmakers in Albany say, you know what, let's pass some tough uh, ethics reforms and, and campaign finance reform with teeth? Uh, look, I, I certainly think that there is a lot of pushback against removing the money from politics. A lot of people see it as an affront to themselves, to their campaigns. You know, we're sitting here with a, an expert who, who lived through that. To me, you know, there's a tremendous amount that could be done. There's a will to do it. I think a lot of the older guard, and some of that certainly in the state senate for sure, but it exists everywhere, uh, you know, is, is standing in the way of that. And the, the people that won't stand for it anymore have to make their voices heard. And we will get into the money and politics in the next segment. Just one last um, Albany issue. Uh, the attorney general now, um, he's going to have more power than he did before as related to uh, police-related shootings um, where there's an unarmed suspect. As somebody who worked in a district attorney's office, was this the only way um, to address the public's concern that, hey, if uh, you, Eric Garner happens in Staten Island, if it had happened in another borough, it would have been treated differently? Or do you think, you know, you're denuding the power of elected, duly elected officials to enforce laws in their particular county or borough? Look, I think we've just started. Um, to really take this on, and I think this was obviously one response, certainly not the only one. What I'd like to see a lot more of is more transparency, whether that means transparency on the street with cameras, whether it means transparency in the grand jury so people know what's going on. I just think that there's a big black box. So you think you should release the reports of the grand jury uh, hearings? I think there's a lot that can be done in a very safe manner that protects witnesses, because that has to be number one. You're not going to be able to build a case if people think they're going to wind up you know, on the telephone pole yep. with their face out there. Um, but there's a lot that can be done to assure people that what's going on in the grand jury is legitimate and the people putting the cases in the grand jury will certainly um, know that the public's going to see what they do. will obviously want to act in a certain way. So I, I certainly think that can go a long way. And I certainly think street encounters uh, being recorded can go a long way. In fact, I predict that in 10 years you're not going to find a police officer where he or she is not with walking around wearing one. And I think that could inert a police officer's benefits because a lot of unfounded complaints could be, you know, wiped out immediately. Richard, can I just, yeah. But what's, what's the reason behind giving the Attorney General this power if there's no collusion between the DAs and the cops? And this has always astounded me because we had the governor out there saying we need to do this, but nothing's going on. So then what's the point of doing it? We're just doing it for an exercise? Or is there evidence of collusion? 
either there is and you have to address it or there's not. And he's addressing it but saying there's not. There's no doubt that this is in a response to people saying that you can't, you know, the DAs are not fair, uh, unbiased observers when it comes to dealing with police. There's no doubt about that. But what I want to note is it's not, that's never turned on its head, right? So there are police officers all the time who themselves are injured. And you don't hear from defense attorneys who say, my client is being prosecuted on behalf of DAs who are working with cops to push my guy in jail. So and police deal, you know, the DAs deal with cops every day in a whole lot of different situations. So, but the only reason that we're doing it is because people feel like there's collusion, but there's really not. So essentially, we've changed the way we work this process because people have a feeling about something that's not true. Th that's no, no, I, I, well, I would think. How would do you it, explain it? Because I would argue from the outside, it seemed with the Eric Garner case, that the district attorney at the time handled the case that he thought his constituents uh, wanted handled much differently than if his constituents were in Brooklyn with the Akai Gurley case. But then that's You're saying my, that interests that's aligned as I say to politics just play away in a DA's yeah, office and it's just otherwise is naive. But nobody will admit to that. They're saying we're How doing this. How can they, Well, then what's the point of doing this? That's my question. But look, in, in the, How in do the, you do in, this without evidence that there is well, quid pro quo, that there's something? But the legislature did not act in this situation, and the Senate and the Assembly couldn't get it together. Yeah. And the governor has a, a limited arsenal in what he can do, and he obviously believed that there's a very serious problem about a lack of faith in our justice system that needed addressing. This is the tool he used. It's the legislature's job to go up there and find a comprehensive solution in an election year next year. Whether that's possible, I'm certainly s skeptical about, but I'm ready to get you know roll up my sleeves and get to work on it. Okay, we talked really briefly about money and politics. Well, on the other side of the break here, um, I got a question, and it's not just a New York question. We'll, we'll start with the assembly, but I also want to hear from the congressman at the table about it on the national level. Big donation just given to Governor Andrew Cuomo, and some people are saying it influenced how a vote went down or maybe a veto uh, came about. We'll talk about that and much more after this.